Welcome everyone, all you Lair Amigos and Out There Amigos to the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research Think and Drink series of virtual talks. We hope you are all as well and healthy as possible given the state of the world in which we live. I'm Ken Giroux, a member of the steering committee of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research. This evening, we will be having a conversation with University of Wyoming President Ed Seidel and my departmental colleague, uh, Gabri Dr. Gabrielle Allen. In just a moment, I'll introduce tonight's moderator who will introduce our speakers. But first, here are a couple of technical notes. If you want to see the speakers only, you can press speaker view. If you want to see everybody, you can press gallery view. That button for those of you in attendance, uh, that button will toggle back and forth between speaker only and gallery view to see everybody. You can type comments and questions into the chat box at the bottom of your screen and everybody, audience and panel alike can see them, questions or comments. You may also type them into the Q and A box there only the panel will see them. We usually host these events every other week. So the next regularly scheduled drink, tink, uh, think and drink, excuse me, will I have a drink, um, is October 27th. That said, we are pleased to announce a special T&D in just one week. Please join us one week from tonight for a conversation with Ellen Carol Dubois, historian and author of Suffrage, Women's Long Battle for the Vote. At this delicate moment in the trajectory of our country, we think the topic is very timely and are happy to add it into our schedule. Ellen will be in conversation with our very own UW's very own Kathy Connolly. If you want to keep in touch with us, you can send an email to humanities at uwio.edu and we can add you to our mailing list. I will type that address into the chat box shortly. You can also see the recordings of our past Think and Drink events on our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research. I will also post that link into the chat box. <clears throat> okay, tonight's moderator is Dr. Scott Hinkle, Professor of English and African, uh, African Diaspora Studies uh, here at UW and Director of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research. Please help me welcome Dr. Hinkle and our speakers. I will disappear. Thank you, Ken. It is my great joy tonight to have Dr. Edward Seidel and Dr. Gabrielle Allen as our guests. Uh, Dr. Edward Seidel is the University of Wyoming's 28th president. Previously in the University of Illinois system, he was vice president for economic development and innovation, leader of the Illinois Innovation Network, founding interim director of the Discovery Partners Institute, founder professor, Department of Physics, Professor in the Departments of Astronomy and Computer Science, Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment, and Senior Research Scientist and former Director at the National Center for Super Supercomputing Applications. And Dr. Gabrielle Allen, who has been Associate Dean for Research in the College of Education, Professor in the Departments of Astronomy and Curriculum and Instruction, and Research Professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Welcome, both of you. And while it seems uh, weird to be midway through your first semester here, I'll also say welcome to Wyoming and welcome to the university. What truly weird circumstances to be taking on big new jobs like you both have, and we are so, so grateful that you're here. And maybe that's the place to begin, uh, you know, in our world of social distancing, uh, maybe it's a little hard to get out and meet folks and talk to folks. So talk to us both, please, about uh, uh, the path that brought you here to us. And because we are the Humanities Research Institute, we would love to hear, I mean, we know we're gonna know a lot about your capacity as like leaders of the university, but it would be also nice to know something about you as researchers, please. Sure, well, thanks. Thanks a lot for having both of us. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And it's actually 
it's a really great uh, venue to uh, have a chance to have a Q and A and to get to know some of the faculty and, and some of the community that might be listening. We've both been participating in some of these uh, sessions. In fact, uh, most recently, I guess we were there for Nicholas Kristoff, and which was really terrific, and I really, really enjoyed that one. Uh, so we can't live up to the building like yes. Nick Kristoff, but on the other hand, you know, we have some things to say. So I'm um, Gabrielle, why don't you say hello? Hi, so I guess I'm Gabrielle, and I'm also very happy to be here uh, in Wyoming and in Laramie. And, um, I'm still actually working for the University of Illinois, so I'm having a sort of soft glide into the, the university. I'll be starting working here hopefully in the, in January. So uh, I'm, it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting time to be sitting here working for Illinois and uh, you know, getting to know getting to know the community. So if you, if you like, I could maybe I'll just say a little bit about my path that got me here. And it's been a long, long, um, very uh, surprising path with just every, at every opportunity somehow turning left when when most people would have turned right <laughs> just because I, I've just done a, a lot of things that were very interesting to me. Um, so I, I guess I'll just start off with, uh, I was an undergraduate at the College of William and Mary, um, which I think taught me the value of a liberal arts education um, and also um, uh, the value of perseverance. And so many of you won't know, I've been more and more open about this. I, I didn't put this on my CV during the interview, didn't discuss this, but uh, I was suspended from college my freshman year for disciplinary problems. Um, I got to know both the Dean of Students, which you should never know as a freshman, and the um, Chief of the William and Mary Police. Um, and so um, I thought about it. I reapplied, I got back in, um, and then I failed out. <laughs> so I, had, I needed to grow up a little bit, so I took some time and I decided I should go to Switzerland and work uh, in a hotel there and learn French. And so I did that. Um, because I love the mountains, I love skiing, and it was only until now that I finally got back to the mountains, I would say. So, it, uh, so anyway, it's been a lifelong dream to live in a place like this. So a um, few other stops along the way. I was a grad student at Yale where I was uh, in physics and astronomy, but um, for those of you in humanities, um, I, most of my social life was carried out within comparative literature and um, uh, the French department. So I played on the Yale French uh, department softball team. And our greatest joy was to try to beat the law school in softball as, as a graduate student. So uh, I used to hang out with people like um, uh, Roberto Gonzalez de Chavarria, who some of you might know of. So he was the shortstop in our, on our team. <laughs> people like that. So anyway, um, so I feel I actually really, really enjoy the humanities and the, and the arts and social sciences side of, of, of university and life. So I just I wanted to you know, I wanted to say that because I'll start talking about science and technology and economic development. But in my heart is, is actually in this in this area. Um, so anyway, um, a few other just things along the way. Um, I, I then began to do focus on black holes and general relativity. Um, and uh, uh, at one point, I was a postdoc at a place called NCSA that I later became the director of, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And that, that was at the University of Illinois. So I went there in 1989. And um, that's where I really learned the, the value of interdisciplinary research. So there, it was the era of supercomputing coming in. There were industry partners there. There were mathematicians and there were artists. In fact, Donna Cox, who's a close friend of ours, is a professor of art at the University of Illinois. She was there. Uh, Robin Barger, who was a composer, was there. And so this incredible interdisciplinary environment, which I learned how to, how to work with teams from, with people from all over the place to help develop uh, how to develop solutions to complex problems. And so when you'll hear us talking later, both, both Gab and I are very passionate about the interdisciplinary grand challenges and, and those kinds of things. Um, but, uh, but one thing that was a turning point in my life that I didn't realize at the time, we had a lot of industry partners there and, um, and I never thought anything about working for a company or with a company, but I, I, I discovered, for example, Schlumberger, which is a, um, an oil and gas company that had a, a corporate partnership with, with NCSA. And in talking to some of the research scientists from Schlumberger, I realized that the problems I was working on in, with my team were very similar to the ones that Schlumberger had. And actually one of my first corporate partnerships was a, a Schlumberger funded one of my grad students who was working on rotating black holes uh, to actually work in the oil and gas industry. So this is a theme that you'll find, you know, develop much, much more in my career. Uh, going forward. So anyway, a, a few uh, stops of, along the way. Um, I ended up uh, being at the National Science Foundation. Um, 
I was at LSU, I, where I probably started really understanding what a land grant university really was, and and uh, and there developed an interdisciplinary center with Gabrielle um, that involved um, 13 departments and and or maybe 16 departments and six colleges, something like this. I forget exactly now, but um, but we set this up in a very interdisciplinary way so that when we left. The person who took over the directorship of that center was actually Steve Beck, who some of you might know. He's a composer and a professor of music at LSU. So just get you the idea that I think a lot about how to bring together arts, humanities, social sciences, and the and the um, social and uh, you know physics, astronomy, and engineering, and, and the business. You know all of those disciplines to to address complex problems. So anyway, I'll stop in a second, but I'll say we made a we made a very interesting move when people were um, in in 2012. When it was sort of time to be the vice president for research somewhere, the greatest opportunity that we both thought we had was to go to Russia and help build a brand new university uh, that would be interdisciplinary by construction, no departments in, the, in this university, corporate partnerships everywhere. And the idea was to build a university that would help energize the, the, uh, the economy of the Russian Federation. This was done in partnership with MIT. Um, Couple stops later, I was VP for economic development across the state of uh, Illinois at the system level, the University of Illinois, and then here. So a lot of those things I learned are my instincts and in, in how I want to drive this university forward on behalf of the state. So long story, but let many details left out. <laughs> Great story. Yeah. <laughs> so some of my uh, story overlaps with Ed, but um, I grew up in London, so, the, so this is the this is the smallest, by far the smallest town I've uh, I've lived in uh, since then. I think I've just been sort of working down. Maybe Moscow was 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 bigger, but um, um, I I my um, a, a first generation uh, college student. Although my parents both worked at, at universities, so I had some some idea of, of what college might be might be about. But I think the big, um, I, I, I was at Nottingham University doing a math degree and then at uh, Cardiff University. I think the big thing that changed for me is my, my PhD supervisor, who was, uh, uh, who was Bernard Schutz, moved to be the first director of a Max Planck Institute in Berlin and asked me and a number of other people in the group to, to move at the same time and go there and help set up this new institute. And so that was something I thought I was going there for a one year postdoc and, you know, stayed there um, eight years or, or something. And so that was a big change and you know culturally that was that was that was very different and to suddenly be embedded with uh, a lot of people who were you know, going out to the theater every night and going and seeing shows and going to nightclubs and i mean just it was it was a, it was a great time and it was just a it was 95 1995 when i w went there and so it was just at the uh, end of the just a few years after the wall had came come down so there was a lot of exciting things happening then it was a great time to be there there were still Russian soldiers in Potsdam where I was living. They hadn't even uh, left yet. And so from there, I you know, moved to uh, Louisiana at the same time as, as Ed. And you know, I found out that once you're in, you know, in the black hole community, I, you know, I didn't realize how long I would be working in, working in black holes. Um, but so I have some of the same then overlapping uh, background as, as Ed in, in terms of spending some time in uh, Washington, DC, which was being, I was a program officer for a couple of years at National Science Foundation. Another fantastic place to, to live and you know, all the museums we were, we could walk to the, the mall and walk into the museums anytime you wanted to go see something interesting. Louisiana, I mean, that was just uh, amazing. You realize that that's really different to most of America and just, you know, being able to go uh, Zydeco dancing on a Sunday morning for breakfast and, you know, those, the people there, just the amazing kind of cultural people. Um, and then when we moved to Illinois, uh, which uh, originally I didn't want to go to such a small town, but um, uh, eventually was persuaded into that. Um, I started at the NCSA, but then I had an opportunity. I, I, I wanted to do something that was uh, do something a bit different than, than keep doing sort of big computing and do something maybe there was a bit more um, diversity in. And so I applied to be the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Education because I always sort of just wanted to be able to do something that was um, you know, potentially could contribute more to, to getting women into science. Um, and, you know, I wanted to learn, you know, to just be in that environment. And so I've been the associate dean there for four years, which has sort of opened up a whole new side of understanding about research. And, and I mean, the, the College of Education there stretches from um, educational historians all the way to people, computer scientists using technology. And so there's been a, been a sort of fascinating time there. I've been working to um, help the college become more connected to computing and data and more connected to other disciplines and more interdisciplinary and more able to work on these grand challenge problems and so helping helping them to think about how do they connect up the these really important and broad things they're doing in education how do you connect that more into the kinds of things that ed was doing in terms of thinking about economic development for the state and so one of those things was 
um, found out that, um, uh, that we don't have any mechanism in Illinois to uh, produce computer science teachers or to, you can't, as an undergraduate, you can't go to a university, any university in Illinois and become a, a computer science teacher. And so that's one of the things that we're really focused on is, is how to do that. Uh, you know, how to build up that, that capacity, still working on it, which is one of the things I want to, want to get a bit further on before I, I leave with people there. But sort of, you know, helping, working on, working on big, big issues in education, particularly those that involve technology. Well, let's maybe get to some of those big issues. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what anyone else would think, President Sayel, but your experience as an undergraduate maybe raises your credibility in my <laughs> eyes and probably, you know, <clears throat> we go through life and uh, weird things happen sometimes, so it's great. And Dr. Allen, right, the, the experience as a first generation student, right, I mean, it's a very important thing these days. Both of you mention in various ways the land-grant university mission for the 21st century, and I know you've been talking a bit about that, so would you talk to us a bit about that vision, please? Sure. So the, I would say perhaps the biggest attraction aside from being in such a wonderful place is that this university is unique in the country in being the only pr uh, major university, I guess there's a, there is another university in the state, but the only uh, land grant university certainly in the state um, and, um, and the one that can have such impact. And um, uh, the idea of a land grant, uh, I, I learned early on the importance of it, but then as a, as a professor and then as a center director in Louisiana and then particularly in Illinois, um, working both at the campus level and then at the level of the system of the university, which I think gave me a perspective that I would probably have never really had before. Uh, the system uh, for the University of Illinois has campuses in Champaign-Urbana in Chicago and Springfield and some regional um, campuses uh, as well in Rockford and um, Peoria and so on. Um, but the idea was that at the system level, you really look at the whole state. You didn't just look at the campus. You thought about the whole state. And then you said, how can we make sure that we really sharpen our value proposition back to the state? And of course, it's the land of Lincoln who signed the Morrill Act, you know, so that's something that we really, really very proud of and, and thought very much about. And so particularly if you're in Champaign-Urbana, um, it's a very, very distinguished university. It has, and my, my physics department there actually has had 13 Nobel laureates in physics associated with it. So the point is that the university really thinks about itself as a, the place that has the best research its competitors are, it thinks of as another land grant, which you might not realize, MIT is a land grant university. <laughs> and so it thinks about that. But it thought less about, I think, the value that it could really bring back to the whole state. And so we really were thinking hard about how to do that. And so we, we had a number of thoughts, but one of the primary one was developing partnerships with communities and other institutions across the state, whether they're part of the University of Illinois or even the privates like University of Chicago, Northwestern, regional universities, Southern Illinois, and so on. So I worked very hard to pull together a consortium that said, we're going to, on top of what we do, and even, even reorganize some of, some of what we do to bring as much value back as we can. And so what does that mean? It means producing uh, the young citizens, the next generation of the workforce, that have a civic duty, that have civ are civically engaged, that have the tools in order to help rebuild the economy of the state. The state needs a diverse economy. We were losing talent like, like Wyoming and West Virginia. The three states with losing the most of their population were Wyoming, West, West Virginia, and Illinois. And so to do things that really made it possible for students to not only want to come to the university and feel like they were getting the education that provided the practical values they need and the, the, the instincts, but also the tools and then the wherewithal to stay in the state and help rebuild the economy. So to me, it's like everything you can do to think about not just what you do on the campus, but the sense of place of the entire region, how, how we do that. And so then, you know, fast forward then to now, um, the idea here, I have a sort of a new tagline that I'm trying out here was, we will build the best in class uh, 21st century land grant university true to the roots of Wyoming. So that's a, it's a sentence that we thought through a lot, um, what, what the meaning of that is. So of course, Wyoming has got a very, very proud culture. And, uh, and you know, the word grit is what I hear a lot about uh, people from Wyoming. Uh, and, um, and the strength and the independence and sort of the, the let's get this done kind of attitude here that I find 
to be unique among uh, places that I've lived, is at least stronger than places that I've lived. So um, if, you, if you put that together with the idea that we have to modernize and become a 21st century university, this means to me, um, what, what the land grant means now in terms of, of diversifying and supporting the development of the economy, it has to involve computing and it has to involve data and artificial intelligence. And, but it also has to in, include the application of all of those things to the things that are important to Wyoming as well, agriculture. Uh, thinking about the creative economy, this is where particularly the arts and humanities and the social sciences would come in. Also um, thinking about how we, how we then bring together the interdisciplinary uh, strengths that a university has, where Wyoming has a number of big problems. We have expertise in, in everything from law to the human condition to, uh, to civil engineering and physics and so on. All of these things are typically needed in order to address the problems that a state like Wyoming has. So then how do we integrate these things in the 21st century way? Uh, so these are all, to me, what, what, it, what the University of Wyoming can be, and they're all in, encapsulated in that tagline. So then within that, I had these four pillars, um, which I hope people can all see themselves in. So it, one is more digital, and to me this means a number of things, but of course more ability in, in this 21st century to reach out with online courses, to reach out and, and sharing data and so on with, with our communities, uh, to address problems, to reach into rural areas, but that you can do with digital techniques and so on. And it also means more digital in what we what we need to have at the university. We need to have more strength in the areas of 21st century techniques and technologies that would include computing, data science, and so on. But it also includes their application in every in every department and potentially literally every department. And so I think it, it can really st stretch into all of those. And then more um, entrepreneurial. We have to come up with more ways to generate revenue uh, streams into the university. This is, um, when, when I say entrepreneurial, I mean faculty thinking about going to the Moore Foundation or the, the National Science Foundation or the Mellon Foundation or whatever in order to get more funding. And then also to train our students no matter what their major is, having a minor at least that's available to all students in, in entrepreneurship and, and, and learning those kind of practical tools. More interdisciplinary, I've already really spoken to that, but I, I see there's even some question on this. Yes, I do think we could organize ourselves very deeply around interdisciplinary themes, and I would love to see this going all the way down to the to the freshman level at, in residential colleges, kind of like Yale has or like, uh, like UCSD has or Rice but to make them programmatic around cohorts of students that have common interests around big problems that, that the university can, can bring to bear all of its strengths. And then no matter what your major is, I'm not trying to replace a major with an interdisciplinary theme, although you might do that as well, but no matter what the major. And then finally, and just as importantly, more inclusive. And by more inclusive, there are a lot of meanings to that. I usually like to frame that in terms of um, a, uh, an innovation environment. So more inclusive means people with every different background, whether it's different ethnic groups, different uh, economic uh, groups, different locations, different parts of the state, international orientation from, with people from all over. This will allow us to address problems that, that, uh, that you just can't do otherwise because you have people with different points of view. And then making sure that they feel welcome and that they're supported here. So all, so these to me are the four pillars. I hope everyone can see themselves in it and I hope we can really organize ourselves around them and then differentiate ourselves from other universities that are, that are slow to that game to, to recognize that. So that's a long, long, long speech. But anyway, nonetheless, I, I wanted to get into enough depth on that so I could, I could communicate that. I'm not sure I can add too much to that apart from saying I think I think one of the other important parts is making sure that the these opportunities are open to everybody in the states as well you know and we've we've driven already across the state a couple of times and we've you know we've heard that there are there are communities in particularly in rural areas where people don't have access to networks and so you know they're not going to be able to take part in even in the online uh, offerings that we can do if they don't have uh, any bandwidth or a data plan that they, they can take part and I mean, that's one of the things that motivated the computer science um, program in at Illinois was the, uh, the the students in the rural areas have no access to computer science courses. Basically, that means when they come to the University of, of Illinois, which is, as Ed mentioned, you know, 13 Nobel laureates in the past in physics and all of these wonderful research opportunities for undergraduates, they, you know, they, all of the students can't take part in them because it's increasingly the case that if you don't know 
software engineering or you don't know how to code, you don't have basic uh, uh, confidence with computers, those, those opportunities are not available to you. And so I think that, you know, we want to make sure that all of the students in the state have access to a, the first class, all of the opportunities that are available at the university. And that, um, you know, I think that it has to reflect as well the, the, the people in the state. And we know that student populations are changing. You know, not all students are coming straight from high school. They're coming, you know, they're coming older. They have, they have children, they have other responsibilities. I think it's sort of looking at how do we make sure that we're still delivering the top class education and, and all of these opportunities to, to all of the students here. And if I could just add one, one point to that, this really means partnerships with communities, community colleges, businesses, and so on, much, much more deeply than, than is, I think, been traditional, not just here, but at, at, uh, at any university. So I think that's very important. So, for example, I've already had conversations with all the presidents of the community colleges uh, and pretty deep conversations about how we can partner. We're working very hard on making it much uh, clearer what your pathway is if you're a student at a community college to the University of Wyoming. I hope this will allow us to grow the, uh, the, the student body somewhat. I don't want to lose the intimacy that we have at this campus, but, uh, but we have 25% of the state has bachelor's degrees and 92% have high school degrees and they're very well educated. So we've got to, and, and, and also looking at the future of the economy, there are some studies by McKinsey. So I'm thinking, you know, with my economic development uh, thinking and training, um, studies by McKinsey that are showing if you have a, only a high school degree, you are four times as likely to have your, your future job market completely disrupted by artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, and so on, than if you have a bachelor's degree. So we have a responsibility to grow our cohort of students that we educate, but I just don't want to lose the intimate uh, sense of what our campus is. So anyway, these partnerships are going to be essential in making these things happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Um, I love that conversation. Um, uh, we in the humanities like to think uh, that we are to some degree robot proof uh, because we focus on the things that human beings do, the human dynamic, the human interaction, the study of the human condition, but it affects all of us. You're exactly right. And, uh, you know, uh, if I can take a serious note, we are, the world at the moment is in a fix. Uh, we have problems of social concern that we humanists think of, that scientists think of, the social scientists think of, people in the professions think of. <clears throat> we are, I mean, to say it, to say it just plainly, we are in the midst of much disruption politically for the election that we are about to have. Uh, we have marches for social justice and racial justice in the streets. Uh, where I sit at this exact moment, about 40 miles to my west, we can see the forest fires and the effects of climate change. We are, we are very much in the midst of a situation where researchers and people who work for universities have much to contribute to these great challenges. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you see us adapting to maybe meet some of those challenges to the state and to the world. Sure, so I'll start. I'm, I'm sure Gab will have um, interesting, Gab is picking up quite a perspective these days on these issues coming from the College of Education. Um, but I'll just say that um, I think that these are some of the major challenges of our time, especially, and I'm, I'm actually quite worried about what's going to happen during the election. Uh, I, I think we may have uh, more, even more social turmoil and, uh, and the, social, the social unrest that we've got at this time is really historic, I think, in, in this country. I think it's probably the biggest movement, uh, certainly since the civil rights movement, but perhaps even more so and more, more broad and it's very deep rooted. And I think the university uh, is the place or is, is one of the key places, let me say, where these kinds of issues can be explored and the conversations can be had. And of course, back to your point, Scott, the, the, the humanities and the social sciences are absolutely central to this conversation, um, as they are to the innovation agenda as well. I, maybe I'll come back to that in a minute, but just on, on this issue. So they're absolutely central. And we need to be have a place where all these kinds of points of view are, are explored. Um, I worked um, with our board of trustees in, uh, in Illinois 
on a set of principles, including those around freedom of speech uh, and what that means at, at the University of Illinois, what civic engagement is. I, I personally led the one on civic engagement that led to some principles. It's funny, you work on this, you have all these ideas, you, you write a 10 page document, it gets distilled down to a paragraph uh, which sounds almost trivial, but uh, the amount of depth of thinking that went into it was it was really extraordinary. So I, I think these things are actually very, very important. And so it just I, I just would say I, I'm committed to making sure that the university uh, is a place where these issues are explored and uh, in, in that students are are exposed to them and probably in ways that they never have been in their entire lives. Um, I, I'll tell you, I, I met I met a distinguished alum of the university um, who told me that she never met, never saw a black person before coming to the University of Wyoming. So I'm just saying this just illustrates sometimes in, in small rural communities how many of the issues that are gripping our nation are, are not really brought home to the communities. And this is the place where they can be exposed and really begin to understand the human condition that we have. So that's very, very important to me that we do that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that we have, I mean, one of the interesting things I think about Wyoming is that it, we only have one university and, you know, we, so we are training basically all of the teachers as well that teach all of the, all of the schools in Wyoming. So I feel like everybody in the state comes, touches the university, whether they've been taught from them at, high, at school or whether they are, then come on to the university and through the, the community colleges. And so, I mean, I think that, that means that we can really do something, particularly if we focus on the, you know, the, the, the teachers at, at all levels and giving them the, the help and the support they need to, to make a difference. Um, I just came from at the last meeting before at, back at the University of Illinois again was uh, meeting with the graduate students in uh, the College of Education who were talking. They had a panel where the graduate students were talking about their experience of teaching the social justice course at the moment. And I had not, I mean, this was very interesting, particularly interesting for me, and they were talking about how hard it is to teach this and how they sort of force the, they, they, they make sure that these hard conversations are had. They think it's important that these conversations are, are, are had with the, the students taking these classes and said about how exhausting it is. You know, they go home and you know, sleep for the afternoon. You know, and it's not, it's very different to going and teaching. And for me, I remember in teaching, you know, a math class, I it wasn't sort of mentally exhausting. And so just, I mean, just thinking about the, the importance of, of, of what our, you know, what we're doing at the university in, in terms of, the, having the venue to have these conversations and then you know have the students being able to be exposed to work on on big problems where they can feel that they are part of the solution as well so i, I think we can really you know there's really possibilities to do something motivated by the you know by these um, urgent questions that we have right now we can in, involve everybody and listen to i think i think the important thing is to really um you know listen to all the partners in this. A lot of what I've been doing recently is working as well with community partners on programs in, in that sector, which again is a, a new thing for me, but sort of understanding how much value they bring to the, the table if we if we bring all voices and then really understand what the problem is. And I think that's, you know, the, these, these problems are very complicated now. They're not, they're not just a physics problem to solve. They're, they're, they're social problems. They involve people. I mean, they, they involve every, every sector at the university. Scott, can I add, can I add a point to that? Just um, on the innovation side, um, I've found I've in my discussion so far, um, I've heard uh, some concern from the arts and humanities side when when they hear me talk about innovation and so on that you know they don't really see themselves in it. And I just give you an example where I mean, we've tried to give you some examples there where I think that we see that. But but um, I had a great experience uh, a couple of years ago where we had a board of trustees meeting in Chicago, and there's a center there called the Innovation Center that is uh, interdisciplinary and it's run by a guy who used to be um, at Motorola or, or you know, some sort of the science and tech kind of guy, but he, he would have these problems that would be posed by companies. So one of them was Caterpillar. So Caterpillar wanted um, a, a solution to some problem involving you know, a front loader or just something that doesn't sound at all like it's arts and humanities. But his rule was, he always had to have teams of students that had uh, different backgrounds, including from the, the social and art side, as well as on the technical and, and sort of engineering side and so on. So I met a student from art and design who was on this team designing something for Caterpillar. And we had, she was at the dinner at this board of trustees meeting. And I said to her, 
So how, what was your favorite experience? She says, oh, definitely working at that innovation center project on the Caterpillar thing. I said, well, how long did it take you to realize that you weren't there just to make better PowerPoints for the engineers? And she said, it took me about two weeks because they were designing things that no one would ever use. And so I was able to, to work with them. And then they began to take me seriously. And then I realized what my role is. And, and they did too. And so, you know, this idea that people are working this uh, again comes to interdisciplinarity but it's like you need all of these different skill sets to address real world problems and that's very important yeah yeah absolutely it's a lovely story <laughs> yeah it was amazing uh so here's what i think i would like to do uh we have many questions already in uh, uh both the q a box and also in the chat just a reminder to all of our participants you can type a question or a comment into the chat and uh you can choose to send it just to us or to everyone. Uh, or you can also type uh, into the Q&A box and uh, uh, then it will just come to our panelists. So maybe I will uh, drag my toes and ask you to talk a little bit more about some of the things that you just mentioned quickly. Uh, and then I will go through some of the questions and I will, I will cultivate uh, where we go from there. But once again, I invite more questions and comments from the people who are our participants. So you've talked a little bit about uh, uh, the interdisciplinary uh, emphasis of your work. And you know, one of the things, <clears throat> one of the things that I find valuable about the land grant mission is that even if it doesn't succeed, it tries to be universal in both like who it invites to campus and our engagement mission with the state and also universal in terms of what gets studied that might not always look like the departments that we have right now uh, it might look like something different but it might look like you know who knows what that might be right so i mean on the point of design i love design thinking and it is something that i try i try to put my brain energy toward a little bit and like you know, I wonder if you might talk about how we might be designed in order to, or redesigned in order to meet some of the challenges we face. Sure, that, that's kind of almost our specialty in a sense of, you know, trying to either bolt onto the existing university, some structures that allow people to come together and sort of to design, design both the, um, the, the venue and then the, the all, everything down to the promotion and tenure that is needed to incentivize people to work together around these um, kinds of uh, complex challenges um, to, uh, well, in fact, this idea of building a brand new university. So sometimes, you know, universities can be quite frustrating because, um, uh, you know, faculty are there and they have all these different ideas and how do you sort of emerge with a common view. So the, the experiment we had was we were at, at, went to Russia where, as Gab likes to put it, she was the first professor who wasn't also a vice president. And so we got to design this university from the ground up to be interdisciplinary with no departments and with certain I got to write the first promotion and tenure document, <laughs> you know, so it was, it was really exciting. And this is also, MIT was the, the sort of, um, the, the university that had been selected by Russia to help build this. So they, they were basically asked, if you could start over again at MIT and sort of, you know, break down all the barriers you got, what would you come up with? And so we really, really could think very openly about what to do. So, so we designed a, a place that had um, interdisciplinary centers, um, it had um, corporate partners, it had an entrepreneurship theme that all the students would be exposed to. Um, and, and some people would say, well, you know, you don't want to become a headmate to corporations and so on. So, you know, what, but, but we were very, very strong about making sure that there had to also to be excellence in, in the basic research and the education. And so, so MIT, by the way, is one of my best arguments for um, how it is that you can both have impact on the economy. So they I'm very familiar now because of their, our association with them, with the studies they've done about their impact on the economy. It's trillions of dollars a year on the world economy. It's hundreds of billions of dollars a year on the Massachusetts and California state economies. And yet, um, no one can say they're not excellent. They win more Nobel Prizes than most uh, universities and so on. So, so these two things can go hand in hand. And I'm not trying to say we, I'm not trying to turn this into an MIT, but there's some lessons to be learned there about the culture. And, and this has to do also with, with the, the promotion and tenure and, and then the structures that are in the university that encourage this. So I'll say one last story and I'll, and I'll turn to, to Gab on this. But um, so Supra Suresh, who was the director of NSF, 
had come to NSF, so I, I reported to him as a head of math and physical sciences there. He'd been the dean of engineering at MIT, and he told me this story about how he'd been at Brown for about um, 20 years. He never even thought about having an invention, thought it would be frowned on by his colleagues in, in the various departments he was in. Um, and uh, then he went to MIT, and within one year, he had four invention disclosures. Um, and just because the, the culture was not only do great things, but make sure you can think about, think about how you might apply it and how this might actually impact people. Um, and then our, our, our sort of you know, fairy godfather, Albert Einstein, uh, we don't really have any direct lineage to him, but he was the person that just sort of we inspired our, most we of our science house. work. We did go to his house. We did go to his house in, <laughs> in, in Kaput in, in Germany. Um, he actually was trained in a patent office because he couldn't get a job out of grad school because he was such a nerdy and annoying student that the professors blackballed him. He didn't get a job, worked in the patent office, and that impacted him so much. He even has a patent for refrigeration, a U.S. patent in 1927, uh, while he was still working in Germany on refrigeration. I'm just saying, so these things can go hand in hand. They don't have to be at odds with each other. Yeah. <laughs> Add to that, that I think that again, the, the in, in this state with the the the, the cowboy sort of the code and and the, the 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 grid and so on and the you know the in a way the simplicity of the system we don't have we don't have a lot of universities we have a direct connection to the legislator I you know I think it, it should be a place where we should be thinking about you know what are the what are the new ideas that are needed to to improve areas where we know that that, that, that uh, students are failing. I mean, we know, I think we know the, the gaps where we lose students and where the workforce is suffering um, and the same other things so that we can, we can really look at those. And again, we need the, we need the comprehensive approach. It's, it's, it's not just a physics problem. We, you know, it, we need to look at the whole, the, the whole situation. And, and I think it'd be really exciting to look at some of those things at the university and, and see what, see what can be done. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Not easy, though. <laughs> not easy, though. Well, no, well, did we come here to do easy things or did we come here to do hard things, right? I mean, good question. Uh, so I'm going to try to call through some of the comments with the time that we have left. Um, you know, and on the topic of impact on the state uh, and the world in which we live, you know, we humanities folks don't generally produce widgets or patents. Uh, but we do engage with our communities in ways that are very deep. So I will just reinforce what Ken put into the chat. Please, please, please register and vote and learn about the issues and get involved in the ways that you can with these, what, 19 days left before the election? Arm yourself with information and then go and express your voice and your vote. And the information on how to register uh, is in the chat. Um, uh, so a couple, maybe, maybe I'll lump a couple of these together. One person writes into the Q&A uh, because we had a conversation about cowboy hats and boots and uh, uh, they write, some would say that one should earn one's boots and or wide brim hat. Uh, it may be better in this state just to be one's natural self. Uh, uh, you see over, uh, it's over President Seidel's right shoulder, you see a beautiful new cowboy hat and, uh, you know, I would like to think that your participation this evening is part of earning that hat, so thank you. I agree with that. I've often said I, this, to this exact point, yes, we want to earn that, uh, so yeah, we're working on it. Yeah. We're what, do we, what do we need yeah. to do? Yeah, do we, the... we need some help, perhaps. So, what, <laughs> need some training. <laughs> uh, uh, my perception of what you two are doing is that you are already well on your way for earning your hats and your boots. Thank, Thank you. you for all of your work. Oh my goodness, in this world. Um, so, a couple of so I'm going to take a couple of questions um, uh, about uh, interdisciplinary teaching, learning, and scholarship. One person. Uh, asks about what specific, if you, I know you've been here, you know, for all of, you know, the better part of a few months, but if you look around and see some structures that need update or change, what those, what might those be? Um, other people uh, write to remind us of the three missions of a land-grant university, teaching, service, and research. How do you see those in your vision? Um, and maybe I'll collapse one more um, I have, I, well, I, well, I received two comments by email earlier today that I want to make sure get mentioned. One is 
in this talk about design for the university, what do systems of shared governance look like between faculty and administration? And another, uh, which I take to heart, and Gab is a, is a first generation student like me, I imagine you take this to heart too, uh, uh, the people who work on campus who are not faculty, service workers, admin, other sorts of service workers on campus, their wages are comparatively low compared to other institutions. So I just wanted to make sure, I know that was a mix of all sorts of things, uh, but I wanted to make sure that they all get mentioned and invite your comments on them, please. Well, let's let's start. Let's just work sort of work backwards, and you can remind us when we forget some of them. But um, on on the most recent one about the the staff, um, I both of us have been staff at in different contexts at universities and at, uh, at, at for example at the Albert Einstein Institute. They, they, we weren't faculty; we were staff paid on on actually. They tried to get me to to come there on the East German pay scale actually, and I I said well, I should at least I'm coming from America I should at least get the West German pay scale. But but anyway, I understand these uh, these issues. I think both um, about uh, the the way sometimes staff feel uh, at a university. Um, sometimes that they're not treated as first class citizens. I've recognized this myself. I felt this way myself. Uh, at, 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 for example, I was at once at the University of Illinois. I was an academic professional before I became a professor. That was a very difficult transition, actually. But I, I often felt that I wasn't uh, taken as seriously. And so I, I just understand this. And the pay scales, of course, were different as well. So um, I'm very sensitive to that. And, uh, and on shared governance, um, I would say um, I believe strongly in it and think there are, the way I would define it is share the, the, the groups that are doing the sharing of the governance include the board, the administration, and then the, the faculty and, and uh, of course, and students senate, you know, they're sort of different um, staff, they're, they're staff senate, faculty senate, students, they all need to be represented in this way, uh, uh, in, in a shared governance, let's just say. Um, and it's complicated, it does slow down things. It also helps people come up with better solutions. And again, I come back to my innovation argument, you have people have very different perspectives that all have something important to bring to this conversation. Um, they've got to be at the table. That allows us to do things better, although it takes longer. Um, on the other hand, we're currently in a budget crisis situation, and I have actually um, two more weeks to present a budget reduction plan to the Board of Trustees. And so in situations like this, what I've tried to do is come up with high level goals that I would hope people could see themselves in that if we focused on them, we can bring more value back to the university. I mean, to the state and the university can do this, but it, it did not uh, allow for enough time for the kind of detailed discussions about what those pillars actually mean in terms of actual programs. But I told the board that we will do our best to articulate as far as we can get, we will make budget cuts that, uh, that allow us to strengthen those pillars in some way. So uh, you know, what, what those pillars are, I've given some, some specific guidance on this to, to, the, um, to the faculty senate, to the VPs, to the, and, and so on. But we will have enough um, it, sort of um, uh, lack of definition, let's say, in the details that we will have time to work these out through the longer processes that we will have. So anyway, but back to the shared governance, I really firmly believe in it and also believe in my role as the president to provide some leadership and some guide stars that we we need to be able to move towards so so anyway there's a lot more uh there were a lot more questions there but Gab, do you have any, anything you want to add to any of those well, i don't have the problem of having to sort out <laughs> the issues there but i certainly think i think that you know the university is only every university is only as good as the staff they're the people that make everything work they're the people that are here you know they're, they're here in the community so that they're, they're kind of meant to be part of the university so i mentioned both my parents were uh, 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 worked at a university as an administrator and as a technician. So, so yes, I'm all for, I'm all for fully supporting people. The other thing, to put it out, is I think it's um, like right now with the pandemic, like everyone is having to work so hard without a break, without knowing what's happening. And I just sort of amazed that this is this is something that everybody at the university. I mean, from the you know from the from the leadership team all the way down to the the people in the um, the janitors and the administrators i think it's a you know what a what a tough time and what a you know i'm just amazed that, the, that you know we that we're able to do this we're able to to, to change all of the different um uh, processes that are going on to take into account covid and you know what, what a what big shift that has been for everybody so yeah it's, it's an amazing time 
Can I, I, I want to just brag about Gab, Gab's family for a second. So you heard that she's the first in her family to get a, a, a to go to college. Oh, my second, my sister. Second, my sister. second. And what turns out, no one in her family had ever gone to university before. Um, all three of the children have PhDs. <laughs> so it's kind of amazing. It so, is amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. But it also shows the kind of opportunity of the educational system. So we want to make sure we provide those kinds of opportunities. That's great. That's great. Um, uh, I, I want to ask two questions, and I guess I'm going to separate them now that, now that I'm saying it out loud. Um, uh, one of our attendees writes, quote, <clears throat> Wyoming is a state that exhibits significant insularity. Sometimes that takes the form of anti-intellectualism. How does UW work in that culture? That's a good question. Um, I've, I've, I've experienced this myself, um, I've, it, having come here. Um, I've, had, I've had a lot of input, let's say, particularly around uh, the decision that the Mountain West took, which I was a part of, on delaying the football season, um, but also around COVID-19. Um, I've, had, I've had people write to me saying they are cutting the university out of their will as long as I'm the president. Um, oh, <laughs> You know, uh, and I think it's, and I, and I had a really heartfelt um, email from somebody, uh, maybe this is too long of a story, but some, someone wrote me an email um, about, uh, please, please, don't you understand, if only you understood about all of the, the political interference in the science that's being, uh, the so-called science that's being driving the, the coronavirus decisions and so on, you would understand. And they, they quoted, they brought to me some web pages. Um, that when I traced them back came from this guy, Alex Jones, who some of you will, yep. will know of. Um, so, uh, and, I, and I personally felt very almost victimized by this. So I didn't, I left this, um, this story out uh, of my background, but I was, um, I went to Newtown High School. I lived in Newtown, Connecticut, where the shootings occurred that killed oh, the wow. 27 children. And so, you know, that, that's something that's just extremely personal to me. And he was promoting the idea that these they, they were merely actors and so on and so um, you know it just really really it really upset me deeply that 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 people well intentioned people are sort of falling prey to pseudo science and sort of um, and I mean not just fake news but I mean deeply deeply dishonest uh, yes. things and so um, I'm sensitive to this but what I have found is in every case when I've actually sat down and talked with people who who've sent me some, and I've spent a lot of time actually addressing people who've written to me uh, and try to call them up, you know. Um, they like, after they talk to you for a while, they recognize that we might not agree on everything, but we can work together to make the state better. I mean, I've literally found that true in every single case, and I spent a lot of time with it. So I think a lot of it is sitting down and trying to just put down all the arrows that, you know, and, and all the hysteria that sometimes we, that all of us are feeling on left, right, you know, center, <laughs> and so on. And we can have these kinds of conversations. So I, I just, I'm optimistic about what we can do in the state. And it's particularly because everybody loves the university, whether they, like, they hate something you've done, they still love the university. <laughs> and we can get a long way through that. That's right. That's Wyoming too. You know, one of the lovely things about the state is yes, things do get heated around here, but like the opportunity to have quality conversations with people, um, it's, it's, it's a higher, those conversations are a higher quality here than anywhere else that I've lived. It's amazing. Absolutely. And the governor is very, very supportive. So the governor, I was astonished. So, so Mark Gordon said, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of, uh, of heat on you. And so I got a suggestion. Why don't we just go up to Casper together and we'll meet with some of the people that really want to talk to you that are upset about this and that and the other thing. Yeah. And we sat down in a hotel for about two hours, the governor and I, with about like less than 10 people but they were important people in, in the region. And we had fantastic conversation. Yeah. And now they've invited me to come talk to the Rotary Club. And so I just feel, you know, you can really have conversations in this state and in places like you can't have otherwise. And so I really, really like that. That's right, it's unique. I haven't been embedded in the university enough to find out um, much about this, but I think that the organizations here that deal with public engagement, you know, we, we need to make sure that this is, a, it, that, that our, our faculty and our researchers and our staff are able, are really reaching out across the state. <coughs> And supporting them in, in doing that and it, you know it's I, I think sometimes public engagement is is something which is uh, unrewarded takes time detracts from a, a faculty's uh, research and, and scholarship and so you know I think we have to I, I don't know how that is is at the university whether there's a mechanism to incentivize and 
encourage um, this kind of public engagement. But I think, you know, I know that there are, I think we, we, we have a, a public engagement uh, unit and so on. So that there are mechanisms to make sure that we're connected to the state. I mean, I think one of the problems is we're down right down in the corner. So have to be, have to get out and <laughs> drive around to get across the state. Yeah, we call it windshield time. You got a lot of windshield time in Wyoming. <laughs> Um, maybe one more question, and then I will uh, ask you if you have closing things that you want to say, because I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, as you might know, uh, there was an important essay that came out, I think, just a few months ago in High Country News uh, called Land Grab Universities. On the one hand, the, the land grant university mission is emancipatory and it makes room for first gen students like me and Dr. Allen and others, right? And that's a history that we can be proud of. And also, uh, one person writes, what is the obligation of the land grant university to, to address the colonial violence and stolen land inherent in the moral act and the implications of our occupation of indigenous lands. So I will I will start with that. Gab might have some comments on this as well, but um, I I certainly am very sensitive to to the reality of, of what has happened over the centuries, and uh, and I do think that we have a responsibility to to acknowledge that. And uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, we Gab and I just on Sunday went to Wind River Reservation and we met with um, James Prosper and some of the elders there, uh, and so. And we, we had a very frank conversation about not only what can we do to help grow the economy, they want to know about the, those kind of things, entrepreneurship and so on, but also about the fact that the students um, who do come from, uh, from the Native American um, nations in particular, um, because they, they don't feel that they're, they're being welcomed or they just, they, so we need, we need to provide more um, uh, leadership uh, with people who are like them and so on. So we need to be very, very, very much acknowledging about the situation uh, historically. And I think uh, to do a very good job of not only recruiting students and giving them opportunities, but providing um, examples for them as mentors and providing, making sure that we work very hard to provide a diverse uh, leadership in, in, in our colleges, our faculty, and, and so on. So there are just the many aspects to this. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, maybe people might want to ask about reparations. That's a very complicated story, but of course the university, I think has responsibility to acknowledge this, but not the wherewithal to really address that, but to be an open forum for these kinds of conversations for sure. Yeah, yep. I second that. And I don't have anything else to add, but yeah. it's, uh, uh, it's quite been part of the conversation at Illinois and um, you know that we, there, we have a, a, a statement which is read at public meetings and, and, and you can use if you want to, to acknowledge the, the tribes. And uh, uh, I think it's quite meaningful. I think that when you, when you hear this um, and you continue to hear it, 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 it makes an impact on how you think about things. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Yeah, it's super important. And thank you for your comments uh, along those lines. I, you know, one of the things that I like to think about, um, President Seidel, you talk about reparations. Sometimes people just think of reparations, importantly, as cash payments, but also reparations after the Civil War got paid in sense of setting up a system of public education, including the land grant universities. Mm -hmm. So good, solid funding to public universities is one of the many ways to address those past injustices. Absolutely. So thank you so much for your time. Do you have like closing thoughts that you wish to share with us, things you wish that we knew or other comments that you would like to make? Um, I just, I feel, yeah, I would like to say that um, I really enjoy having a dialogue like this. I wish we could do a more in-person dialogue. Yeah. One of my favorite things to do is to talk with faculty about what they'd like to, to do and to brainstorm about how we can not only think big, but deal with just an immediate issues that we've got at hand. So um, I look forward to having more, more, oper uh, more opportunities to, to have these kinds of conversations and more in person. And as soon as we can get past this coronavirus thing, I, I'd love to go out with you, <laughs> with you all for dinner, you know, and have conversations and so on. But maybe just in spite of the difficulties of stepping into a job like this at this time, we love it here. I mean, we really love it here, and I'm very excited about the future of the university and what we can do in the state and. And it's going to be a, it's going to be hard. The next months and next year are going to be hard. 
I don't want to sugarcoat it, but uh, I'm going to try to make sure we put ourselves in situations so we can grow out of this and be as strong as possible in the future. Yeah, just, I mean, we've had a great welcome here and um, I'm just very happy to be here. People have been very friendly, very generous with us. And so just like Ed, looking forward to uh, actually getting out and meeting people in person as well as uh, over Zoom. Great, it's very important to me that you both feel welcome here. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your leadership. We look forward, we look forward to more of these conversations. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot.